Hello and welcome to the Startups of London podcast. I'm your host Ozan and the founder of Startups of London. Today I'm joined by Leroy Lawrence, a founder of Pidgey. Pidgey is, in their words, described as, and I really like the app, revolutionary new app for traveling shopaholics that allows users to conveniently send a little bit of their experience home. So when I first read that bit, sending a little bit of their experience home, I wasn't entirely clear on what it meant, but the next sentence really did it for me. Pidgey's reliable delivery patterns pack, ship, and bring your purchased items home to your doorstep. So my understanding, just coming from this a very fresh, uh, first time hearing this sentence type of a point of view, is that you buy something when you're traveling, and they they help you with the hassle of like putting that on, into your bag, uh, worrying about the weight limits and so on, and, and then you just find it in your doorstep. So welcome, Leroy. Was that accurate? And yeah, let, tell us about the business. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head there. You've explained it perfectly. With Pidgey, it's really a first world problem initially. You know, going on holiday and not being able to get everything you want into your suitcase. It's an ongoing issue for me. I suspected that other people had the same issue as well. But what I've discovered is that it's also a um, issue for sellers because sometimes sellers in street markets and holiday locations they suggest to you, well, look, if you want to buy this or this item, we can send you over to FedEx or DHL or whatever the local shipping port is, and they will send it home for you. Um, but if you're in the shop, you don't know how much it's going to cost. So that's an issue and it turns mm. you off and it seems like a very really difficult, convoluted thing to do, which it is. Or if you're already at home and you're still in communication, which is only a minority, naturally, of people who do that, who are still in communication with shop sellers on their, their previous vacation location, a vacation uh, uh, spots, um, and they say, "Look, I want to buy some more of that item." And then the sellers, uh, from, this is from conversations I've had with sellers. A seller will then go down to DHL themselves, get a quote. Uh, once done all the measurements and everything else, and then the quote will be too expensive for the for the customer. So they get back on the phone, they tell the customer, and the customer says, "Oh, thanks very much, but no, it's too expensive." So they just wasted half a day, and they just kind of throw the towel in. Um, so whenever I spoke to um, when we were designing uh, the app, um, these were things that we took on board to make sure that we could make this whole process extremely simple um, and all the answers you want, you get them with a the click of a button. You know, it, it almost became a cliche in startup world that uh, it's, it's about the execution, not the idea. I don't even mention it and talk about this anymore. It's become such of a tender thing nowadays. But I think this is a good example of that. I kind of empathize with the user uh, with their first solution because I've definitely been in that spot. And I think a lot of us have been. You're, you're, you, especially if you find an item that is heavier than usual, uh, something like a decoration for your home and so on. I remember we were in Cuba and we had these paintings that, that we loved and we bought a few of them. Uh, because they were really cheap and they were really artistically well made and so on, but uh, it was uh, like it, it it was a difficult task uh, to organize, and you're not in the mood of organizing logistics because you're on holiday, right? So mm-hmm. I actually do really like the idea, but it really does not matter what I think at the end of the day. It matters uh, if we can quantitatively uh, uh, validate this. Uh, how have you gone about uh, validating this idea? It might because some of the ideas that I've I've spoken to a lot of founders, some of sometimes it will sound really nice. It will it will make a lot of sense when we talk about it. But in reality, the the, the demand and the appetite in the market is just not there. So uh, you spend uh, you end up spending two years of your life uh, for something that's never going to come to fruition. Uh, yeah. Because of that reason, it is absolutely critical to validate before starting. Uh, so how have you gone about that? Exactly, yeah. So, 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 so I'm not a first-time founder, so fortunately I've been around a little bit. And the first thing I did um, when I got back to the UK was to hire a, an MBA uh, graduate and a PhD graduate from the London School of Economics to sit down and go through it with me and to write a, a report, basically. Oh. Uh, two completely dependent reports. Um, That's great. One of them... Uh, one of them was more about tourism 
uh, how much market there was in the retail space and how much extra market there was that's been missed out because of the lack of kind of logistical ability to use to send your items home. And then on the other side, um, we were looking because it's effectively a marketplace, it has buyers and sellers. We had to then do some research into the sales side as well, the, the supply side, and see if if it was something that they would be willing to use. So yeah, so before I spent a penny on designer development, um, I spent all the money um, that I put forward on on research and uh, and not just us kind of theorizing and reading documents and getting UNTWO data, but also going out and interviewing people uh, in different countries and in the UK and getting their feedback. Because of course, as you're, as you're kind of highlighting, you can sometimes have a problem that is a problem for you, but it just isn't a problem for other people. So far, the, the, and, and, and again, the feedback has been quite unanimous that it is a, a problem for other people on both ends of, of the scale. Um, when they speak to me verbally, but that doesn't mean that the product I'm building will be good enough for them to use. So we've been very meticulous and careful. But even now, we've just released um, the Pigeon, the Home and Pigeon uh, app on iOS and Android. We still consider this to be very much part of our uh, journey to find product market fit. So we, we've kind of done the best we think we can do right now, but ultimately the market always decides. Um, so we're... We're, we're putting it out there to get as much feedback. We've made it as easy as possible to get feedback um, from users um, so that we can squeeze this into a product that um, works for everyone. And I think someone said read just recently that whatever your first MVP is, you should look back two years from now and laugh at it. It should be yeah. like, wow, we actually got so away bad, with using yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that's what it should be. So I think... Sometimes people think when you release a, a, a product, it has to be perfect. Everything has to be great. But you know, we could go away and get lots of. We could have started off with, with, with product managers and designers and use their experience. But I always believe the market decides, and I'd much rather make sure we interact with users and get their feedback and make this be what they want it to be, rather than what I think they want it to be. Uh I love your ex your your approach to this. Uh, when you say the market decides, it's definitely. Verge coming from an entrepreneur who uh, this is not the first time for you. I, I, I can feel it because I'm in the same boat. Uh, the, the, I've built a few startups myself and uh, it's, it's a very humbling experience uh, in terms of um, it really calibrates uh, how you think. Because of that, it's yeah. the most wonderful thing in the world because it, it's 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 a good test. It's a good it's a good stress test uh, on on the quality of your thinking and so on. Because in business, in in some areas of business, and let me go into a tangent for like ten seconds here. For working in a corporate environment, I don't know if you've been in, in one. The, the yeah. success of your work, the worth to of yourself to the company is ultimately decided by what other people think of you within the organization rather than market facts if you've created like your impression this the similar craft or whatever but in 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 entrepreneurship you're just synchronized with reality uh, you're you're almost bonded with it so there is no escape from it and it's humbling in that sense it's actually quite beautiful in a way in a weird capitalist <laughs> kind of uh, yeah, kind yeah. of way Beautiful it's like though. gravity yeah. is like you can, you have yeah. to respect it right otherwise you're yeah, going to you, break your leg either, either you get your company into the black or you don't and there's no there's no gray area ultimately your approach i really like this i adore this and uh, i'm i'm going to steal and share it with other entrepreneurs uh, when they need it so just as a case i i'm going to say you know there was this guy who actually went out and hired an mba and a phd before he launched his product so that's how you should think about validation i think that's a perfect example uh, so what what was the results that came out of those uh, those research any any interesting insights yeah. that you could share with us definitely um well first of all there's lots of worry about covid is is covid going to is, is tourism going to return to uh, to pre covid levels and the data from unwto predicts that by the end of 2024 we'll actually just begin to overtake 2019 levels of tourism there's lots of pent up energy and interest in tourism that's just been waiting to kind of get out of the yeah. bottle so there shouldn't be too much worry on that side and then we had to look delve a lot deeper into not just what people spend in general when they go on holiday but what they 
spend on retail spending and where they spend it. So we, we built this, this matrix and we asked it lots of questions such as, where in the world should we be running the MVP, the initial rollout of this product? Because you can't obviously roll it out everywhere. You have to kind of niche down your, your, out, your outlook. So we, we listed every country in the world. We asked this matrix. It sounds like I'm speaking to Keanu Reeves, but I just mean uh, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're trying to find the, uh, the vectors, right? So which, from which country to which country would be the most profitable and the biggest demand for? Yeah, exactly. And, and not just that, but also like availability to receiving money. So who can use PayPal or Stripe? That's a um, concentration as well. That's true. Yeah. And those sort of things. Um, so then we narrowed it down and, and we, based on the, the data that we, we extrapolated, we, we decided to start on focus on three selling countries, Indonesia, Thailand and Mexico. So these are all high addressable market sizes. So the actual... We calculated the total addressable market was 49 billion for Pidgey on, on this on this revenue plan. Mm-hmm. Um, but three of the highest that also met the other points were those three countries that, that I mentioned. And so so I'm I'm actually in, in Bali right now. I'm here on the ground Amazing. doing sales, onboarding people uh, from, from shops around the area and it, it, it explains them how, how it works. But I have a suspicion that actually it's Mexico that will be in the short term, one of the mm-hmm. most uh, beneficial countries. And what we're, what our, our plan is to do is to actually just focus on one holiday location at first, whilst we find product market fit. But again, because the market, I want the market to decide. I didn't just say right. I think from that it's going to be in Mexico. We started. We're starting with three, and then whichever ones gives us what information and what feedback we need the most, we will then go and stick in that. I, I do suspect it's going to be. Mexico but what I didn't want to do is make an assumption that it's going to be Mexico and actually miss out when actually really it's Bali is the best place for us to be so yeah yeah so when, when people talk about, okay, it's not about the idea, it's about the execution, it's, it's difficult to put that into actions and, and real life examples. But I think this is a great case for any of any entrepreneurs, any founders, or people in this startup ecosystem and, and generally listening to us out there. Okay, which country do I start with? This is an execution problem. The decision process of that, the data you collect is an execution problem. And if you mess that up, like you're hurting the chance of success for the business. If you get that right, then it's, it's, a, it's a good win for the business. So that's the exact, I think that's a perfect example of how to think about how to execute your idea after you've passed the initial stage. But again, it doesn't end with this. So I would like to come back to you and ask about this, Leroy. So what in terms of building the application have been critical? Uh, like how does this work uh, is, is what I'm trying to understand because it can be really complex. So if you could go into some more details about in terms of what are the challenges uh, in building the app uh, that, that you've come through. Yeah. And I'm, I'm imagining that these are things about, okay, how do I find suppliers? How do I match them? How do I uh, get to the critical size? So this, this is working in a self-sustaining manner. The people will have issues. You have to have a customer uh, service aspect to this or you have to do it in an automated way you have a lot of stuff about lo- um, location the tech stack you have what development framework this was built on so a lot of very important things tell us about, uh, your yeah. journey about so, these so in the initial product map product design phase uh, and it's a similar story to our marketing messaging we I had to constantly put myself into the shoes of someone faced with that particular problem at that moment in time and one of the feedbacks that comes back again and again with tourists is that you're you're moving very quickly in a way. You want you don't want to be doing serious things, taking sitting around. It happens to you sometimes, um, but you you want everything to be kind of flowing and it be something that you can enjoy. You don't um, want to be in problem solving mode, which is what you do in yeah. work. So in holiday, you want to break from that. Ex- exactly this. Um, so we so when I designed the initial specification for the app i wanted to make sure that the connection between the buyer and seller was very quick um, and that the purchase was quick and that you finding out how much it would cost to send it home is quick and for you as a customer that's the end of it so we use qr codes uh, to connect so if let's say the shop seller let's say they already have a pidgey account they've already listed a couple of things on, the, on their pidgey shop but you come in and you say well i want this buddha head I'm going to buy that, buy that from you. 
and but it's not listed on their shop. It takes 10 seconds with the Pidgey app to just take a picture of it, write Buddha head, there's drop downs for the size and weight, and, and that's literally it. Click publish and it's released onto their shop. Now for the customer to connect with them, they just scan the, the unique QR code on that on the seller's Pidgey app and it takes them straight to that shop. And they can add items from their shop as if they were using you know, uh, Amazon or eBay, anything like that. Just, just add to cart, very, very simple. Go to checkout. It then tells you exactly how much it costs to send it home because it already has your address in there from your account and knows where you are. And you can be okay with it and you click pay and you can pay with methods of payment which are very comfortable to you, such as your Google Pay, Apple Pay, PayPal. And what I've, whilst I'm here in Bali right now, I've actually realized that trying to use your just your normal debit card or credit card can be a real ache. So I, I'm, I've been trying to pay for some stuff. When you go into like a restaurant, it's fine. Hmm. But I found uh, with a lot of, uh, if even say now I went to a supermarket and tried yeah. using my card, it got declined, but yet the money came out of my account still. So it can be a real ache sometimes. So we've I, made I sure- I remember experiencing that when, when I was in Bali as well. <laughs> yeah. The, the um, infrastructure so, is uh, different, uh, so sometimes it doesn't work. That's why we used to uh, use a lot of cash for, for the transaction, and I think a, a lot of people do still. Yeah, and, 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 and the thing with cash as well is that you've got to now go and pay your extra like $5 every time you go to the ATM machine to take money out of the machine all the time. So it becomes expensive really quickly. But if you're in a shop already, you decide what item you want to buy. It might be more than you're used to spending in cash. It might be like a really nice ornament you want for your house that might cost you a few hundred dollars you don't normally have that have it in your pocket you can just use the payment methods which are common to you like your paypal or apple pay or whatever and make that payment and then the seller will receive it into a way that into a, a method which is useful to them so it'll either be bank to bank or it'll be via paypal or via stripe stripe into their account when it, when it goes to the side so you no longer have that kind of issue of your card being declined because you're just paying the way you normally pay and also it, it converts the currency. So when they put in how much it costs in their currency on their side, on the seller side, on your phone, if you were operating pounds, it just gives it to you in pounds. You haven't got to start doing math on your fingers when you're in the shop. And again, this is all part of just making it extremely simple, extremely yeah. straightforward, extremely quick. And you know, they don't need to use much of your thinking space to get it done. Uh, there are a few points I would like to go back in terms of the business, but before that, I'm honestly curious about your experience as an entrepreneur because you said this is what this is what this is not my first time. Um, yeah. Like, can, can we take a side road and talk about that for a few minutes? Uh, okay. What have you built before this? So in 2008, uh, I was the first black founder of a regulated stockbrokers in the UK. So my background is capital markets and financial services. Got that's it. what I mean. Um, so I was in the city, uh, both in the UK and in Germany, in my kind of formative years. And someone dared to say to me, I couldn't do it. That, that, that's basically my whole life's motivator. <laughs> if you tell me I can't do it, I, I'm going to go and do it. So probably simple to, to, to manipulate. So um, yeah, someone, one of my bosses told me, oh, you never start your own stockbrokers. So the next year, I launched the stockbrokers. Um, Challenge accepted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so I did that for four years before going off to an investment bank in Switzerland after that. Um, and then... Um, I set up uh, Quadrant Capital, which is a, originally it was, it was uh, a hedge fund, but then we decided to concentrate more on the technology side. So uh, we just licensed out our, our quant automated algorithms to other hedge fund managers and other money managers instead, as it's a lot, a lot easier for us to do and made more money as well. So um, yeah. but those are the two main companies that I've, I've started from beginning to end. Amazing. Uh, and this was, uh, you said 2008 and 2010 ish? 2008 and then 2014 for awesome. Quadrant. Mm -hmm. And and then my, I guess actually there's a third one, which is I had this brainchild in about 2018 that Africa was going to be a great place to invest into for VCs and Kenya especially would be great for online trading apps. Yes. So did my research, raised a little bit of initial capital, went to Kenya sat down with the regulators, put this whole wonderful thing together. And because it was our back, it was my background, my, me and my partner, it was for us, it all just felt very simple because we could do it with our eyes closed. But then trying, to, but then we needed like lots of capital adequacy money, more than twice as much as you do in the UK, Kenya. And so when we tried to raise this money, VCs were not interested because 
it was always going to be pre-revenue until you got your license. And they didn't really understand the whole concept, work in the regulated environment like that. Uh, and then also Africa. We mentioned Africa and people shuddered in their skin. You see them just shudder mm. when you mention investments into Africa. And, and at that time, in 2018, there are about 200, less than 200 million going in through kind of investments into startups in the whole of Africa at the time. Yeah. And now there was like 22 billion in the last year going into Africa. So suddenly Africa is in vogue now for startups, investments, lots of really great stories such as oh, Flutterwave. This is just a perfect uh, example of timing. It's uh, sometimes you have the perfect idea, but even if you're uh, two years early, uh, it doesn't work. I, I experienced that in other domains as well, but yeah, carry on. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, so the timing was, uh, was but, but the timing was right, but the, the, the belief of investors hadn't caught up at that moment in time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now six other companies have gone in and done exactly what we said we were going to do in okay. that time successfully. But then just when we were about to throw the hat in the bin, someone gave us a million pounds to go, to go, and, to go and do it. <laughs> so we ended up having this whole kind of agreement with them. Uh, I'm now kind of project managing softly, but I'm not really running it, but it's still our baby sort of thing from a distance now. But, you know, we would have been far more hands-on if we'd, had the capital at the time, but now we're kind of hands off, but it's still, it's still happening. So some original investors realized that, okay, sorry, you were right back then. Um, let, let's make it happen now. So we've got another team working on that at the moment. This uh, 10,000 hour rule, uh, although it's been disp uh, disproved, uh, I guess, uh, but uh, useful as a, as a funny analogy, I think still to spend 10,000 hours on something. And I, I remember uh, what I was doing uh, a training in a class, uh, and uh, I'm Turkish, by the way, so there is this tradition in the later Ottoman culture where there is this school of apprentices, and then apprentice works with the master for seven years, and then mm -hmm. after seven years becomes this has this different title. It's not the master, it's not the apprentice, but it's kind of like a craftsperson or type of a thing, right? And, yeah. and, and you know what I did? I, I calculated how many years it would take uh, for someone in, in the pace that we understand now uh, to spend 10,000 hours on something. And lo and behold, it's seven years. So I thought oh. that the connection was amazing, that that was really interesting. So that it, it's kind of like a an indirect validation of how the human brain uh, processes uh, a lot of things. Uh, so seven years, 10,000 hours, whatever that is. I think entrepreneurship has that kind of a arc uh, as well. Like you need to spend a certain amount of time uh, before your quality of thinking, your emotional maturity, and like what you want and what you can give up in life have kind of found a harmony within each other so you can think with a clear head. Would you agree? You know, yeah, 100%. I think I can see why so many first-time, so few first-time founders make it, work sometimes you get a bit of luck along with your own kind of natural skills as well and it happens but you can see why for first time well i think what happens is first time founders uh, if it doesn't if it does work for them great but sort of a small minority but the ones who are able to come back again a second and third time if things didn't work at all are few and, and for them to actually learn you know be putting in those ten thousand hours and keep on having that same energy to be able to keep on learning and learning and realizing that you're an eternal student ultimately because the, everything's moving and changing all the time it's again another small minority that are able to really succeed based on experience and learning rather than kind of just i, I tried it it didn't work i'll go back to working in the corporate environment instead sort of thing so i can yeah you know, i can i can see the, the sense of that it, it takes a certain amount of tenacity, a certain amount of build, and people, especially people uh, in your environment that support you. We had a, a, another founder in the chat, and we had this amazing moment where we were talking, both talking about the torture our wives have gone through supporting us mentally and <laughs> emotionally. Uh, like, uh, I think there should be a support group for entrepreneurs, uh, husbands and wives, uh, in a way, uh, because it's difficult. Uh, and like people say, okay, um, success came to me in seventh, eighth, eighth year. But nobody talks about, I mean, I guess they do talk about it now, but still, it's difficult to empathize with that exact moment. You're in your fifth year, you're in your sixth year. You've tried a lot of things. You've failed uh, well. Okay, uh, you learned, but you, you don't know you're going to be uh, successful. So it's it, it's kind of emotionally very, is a big burden to carry. So how did you manage that? Yeah, I think the first thing you have to do in any startup is just take your ego 
put it in a box and bury it in the ground somewhere. Yeah, um, so true. Because it'll be, yeah. So yeah, you have to kind of be humble in that sense. You, you do, I can't keep going on else. Me personally, I have a, a deep kind of pathological sense of self-belief that I've always had. That doesn't mean that after any successes previously or any failures that have happened in the past or may come again, that I think it's my destiny that I'll do well. I don't feel that way about it at all. I'm kind of Taoist about it, really. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I'm not going to roll over and die, hopefully. I'll still be here. And I've, I've had fun. It's, I, I try and enjoy the journey as much as I can. Um, and I make sure I enjoy the adversity as well. Because when you have adversity and you overcome it, it feels all the better at the end. And also you learn, you learn at an advanced rate during adversity. It's like being in a war. You know, World War II, it, loads of inventions came around during adversity. And, it, and it's the same when you're an entrepreneur. You know, it's, it's adversity that really gives you those, the massive uplift of, uh, of information that you need to make it work, whether it's this time or a later time. I'd just like to circle back to the business for perhaps uh, one or two questions. Uh, there's something still um, I'm curious about. I was going through your documentation uh, and, and what the app is focused on. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So you do have a marketplace component as well within the app, right? Uh, where you try to bring people together from. Yeah, so it wasn't part of the initial plan. It took a while before I had even noticed that we built a marketplace by accident. And it's, it's unavoidably a marketplace because there are two sides. There are, it's the same app, but you can just click a button to switch between seller mode and buyer mode, same way you can in any other marketplace ultimately. And I, we, we could have had it where there was no app for the customer, but then the customer still has a bunch of the same problems with tracking his order, trusting the seller, what payment he can what payment method he can use those he or she can use it's the same problems i have there yeah. and if we had it only the customer has the app and the seller doesn't have an app to use then they're just confused when a random person from fedex turns up and says hi i'm come to collect this buddha head please so oh. they needed to also be in connection with it and also for them to do recurring sales because a, a big part of this is that we what I, I think we can 10x the, the income of small businesses who sell using this app because you normally never see a tourist ever again but with this you can keep on selling to them again and again when they go home so it's effectively a marketplace but the way it's kind of we, we it's it's more about marketing it at the pain point so um whilst i'm here in bali we're like i said we're onboarding lots of sellers right now to use and understand and to list their products but we want it to be that when a, a tourist enters their shop and says, I want to buy this, but it's too big. Here's my pain point. They say, sure, no worry. Just uh, download Pidgey quickly and just pay for it using Pidgey and go back to the beach. It'll all be taken care of for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's what you want. But, but ultimately, once you do go home, you can buy from them again. So therefore, it is a bit of a marketplace as well. I just have one more thing to share with you. And I know we're out of time, um, but have to share this because I think it's relevant. Uh, it, this almost make, makes me think of two independent things. One of them was how rather Hotmail itself. People yeah. people used to send each other an email, and at the, at the end of the email, this mail was sent by Hotmail, get your own account here, and so on. So every email yeah. sent was a marketing act for Hotmail itself. So that's kind of how they grew. Um, and uh, on the other hand, in the UK, if if, if you own a car, uh, you, you have to download a lot of apps. I have a folder in my phone for car related stuff and i have eight i have 10 apps in there right now and i'm, I'm sure i'm going to add an 11 one of them is for <laughs> parking one of them is for something else but the, the point is if for example westminster is using ringo as an app you have to download ringo so even if the app is really bad you have to download the app so that's kind of a an interesting perspective and in in your case this might be relevant because if you get the sellers and, and agree on them, the shopkeepers, to say, okay, this is how I do business. You need to download PG. Everyone who walks into shop is a potential download for you, and that can be a great growth channel. Uh, is I'm sure you you've thought of this and you're using this, but I think this is just one of the examples that shows the potential of your business. Yeah, definitely. So it means that we can focus like 80, 90 percent of our our marketing channels it directly into the shop sellers. And they can do the, the kind of sale at the end of, of promoting it to the customer. Amazing. 
Leroy, thank you very much for joining this chat. As we come to a close, is there anything you would like to share with our audience, any call to actions or any updates that you have? Yeah, I'd just say make sure you uh, download the Pidgey app, Pidgey the Homing Pigeon on iOS and Android. And when you go on holiday, be sure to use it. I'll for sure try it. First time I'm abroad, hopefully soon, as the summer comes along. I'll give this a go and I will share this with my friends as well because I think this is a brilliant idea. And I hope this becomes amazingly successful in the coming months and years. Thank you for joining. Thank you.